all present. Can we stand for the national anthem, please? Please remain standing while Dr. Farrell would lead us in prayer. Almighty God, giver of all good things, look with favor upon all of us gathered here this evening. Show us with your blessings of peace, love, and fellowship as we engage in the consultation with the people of Princess Town for the betterment of the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago through constitutional reform. And at the end of these proceedings, take each of us safely back to our homes and our families. Amen. On behalf of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, I am pleased to welcome you to this special meeting. It is a meeting when you can, where you can share your ideas, views, and recommendations for reforming our Constitution. The Constitution is the highest law of the land and the cornerstone of the nation's commitment to upholding fundamental human rights ensuring social justice and public accountability, and creating a strong democratic framework to guide us, to guide its future development in the interests of the welfare, prosperity, and happiness of citizens. My committee is ensuring that you, the citizens, and in this particular case of Rima, sorry, of Princestown, are at the forefront and center of any reform initiative, which is why we are here today. Constitution reform is a complex and lengthy process, not just in our country, but worldwide. We acknowledge the numerous past attempts, which only reinforce the need for our collective, persistent, and consistent civic duty for the betterment of our nation and future generations. I express my sincere gratitude for your presence here today. Your contribution is invaluable. Your voice matters, and we are here to listen. And it is in, to that, towards that end, I will remind the audience of our mandate. We are required to initiate, consult widely, and guide the national debate towards the generation of a package of ideas and opinions which will be distilled into a working document, which will become the working document for the Constitution Conference to be held in June 2024, just about two months from now. So I will now hand you over to Dr. Farrell, who will give you a little more in-depth uh, statement into what we are about and the history of uh, the work that previous committees have done and where we are today. 
Our moderator to this evening is Council Petronella Basdeo, and she will be uh, taking over right after Dr. Farrell has made his presentation. Dr. Farrell. Thank you very much, Chairman, and good evening to everybody this evening. <clears throat> Happy to be here in Princess Town. Uh, we've, been, we've been saying wherever we go that this is the, the fifth time that the country has been engaged in this process of attempting constitutional reform since the 1976 Constitution. Uh, the, the, the 76 Constitution is the one which is currently in operation, is the one that we currently have. There have been a couple of amendments to that Constitution, but basically what we are operating with today is the 1976 Constitution. Now that Constitution which we had, uh, had been preceded by the Wooding Commission. Uh, the, the Prime Minister at the time, Eric Williams, after the 1971 no-vote campaign, had initiated the Wooding Commission on constitutional reform, and they spent about two years between 1972 and 1974 doing some of what we are doing. They went all around the country at that time, and they came up with their report. Uh, unfortunately, the Prime Minister at the time did not accept many, or perhaps even most of the recommendations of the Wooding Commission, and essentially what we did in 1976 is that we replaced the Governor General with the President, therefore making Trinidad and Tobago a republic. And we made some other important changes. For example, we instituted the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, separating that from the Attorney General, and a couple of other changes. But in essence, the 1976 Constitution was pretty much the same as the 1962 Constitution, which we had at Independence. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember, the 1962 Constitution, which we got for independence, came about in a rather hurried fashion because we were part of the West Indian Federation between 1958 uh, up to 1961. Jamaica opted out of the West Indian Federation, and both Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago moved very hurriedly to attain independence from the British in 1962. So the process of creating that 1962 uh, constitution was somewhat hurried. All of this to say that the constitution that we are operating with in Trinidad and Tobago today, 2024, is essentially the same constitution that we had in 1962. And, I, and I, it's important to appreciate that. So all of the structures that we have, the institutions that we've put in place, the balancing of the power between the executive and the judiciary and the parliament was, came out of the 1962 constitution. In fact, it's a little bit worse than that because some of the institutions which we put in place in the 1962 constitution were in fact established by the British, for example, the service commissions were established in the 1950s. So that we have a set of institutions operating in this country in 2024 which were essentially established by the British in the 1950s and the 1960s. And we have seen, I think, that uh, over the years, many of those institutions have not been working effectively for us. And it didn't take very long after the 1976 Constitution was put in place that the NAR administration in 1988 established the Hayatali Commission under former Chief Justice Isaac Hali at, at the time, uh, included people like uh, Michael E. Labastide and Hamid Ghani at the time, in an attempt to begin a process of reform. This is a mere 12 years after the 76th Constitution. That effort was essentially interrupted by the 1990 attempted coup, and the NAR went out of office, and nothing came of the Hayatali Commission. The Manning administration, the first Manning administration, really didn't do anything on constitutional reform. They were in office for about four years. The Pandey administration came in, and although they did not initiate a process of constitutional reform like Hayatali or like this one, there were important pieces of legislation that were put in place at that time which had significant constitutional implications. 
These were, for example, the Judicial Review Act, the Freedom of Information Act, and the Integrity in Public Life Act, which had significant constitutional implications. Then we had a group of businessmen, so very interesting, this is not a, an initiative that was done by any government body or by the government at the time. A group of businessmen called the Principles of Fairness Committee in 2006 drafted a constitution. Again, reflecting the need, apparently the need, for some kind of reform. Seeing that effort by the business community, the Manning administration then had Ellis Clark work on a series of drafts of the Constitution through a process of consultation. So we have the 2009 draft Constitution done by Ellis Clark. And then in 2013, the UNC administration had the Ramadan Committee, which again went around the country, much as much as what we are doing, had a report done in 2013 and put forward a couple of amendments to the Constitution, which lapsed when the UNC went out of office in 2015. So this is the fifth time that the country is attempting constitutional reform. And the point is that I think that there is a recognition, there was a recognition on the part of every administration that the constitution needs to be changed. It needs reform. That the institutions that we have, which constitute our, con our, our way of life, how we work and operate, are not working very effectively. And we see the results of some of that in some of what is happening in our society today. So there is an imperative, there is a need for constitutional reform, hence this committee. Now, what we are doing is that we are doing some of what the Wooding Constitution Commission did, that is going around to the country. We are going around to all of the 14 regional corporations and we are meeting in Tobago. But more importantly, unlike Wooding, Wooding Commission had no internet, no email, no social media, we are taking advantage of modern technology in order to reach the population of Trinidad and Tobago. So we have received to date hundreds of submissions from the public via email with their recommendations on constitutional reform. We have had people respond to a questionnaire that we put up online asking them questions about certain aspects of our constitution to get their views on that. We have asked all the office holders in the constitution, the DPP, the Chief Justice, everybody who holds office in the constitution to submit, uh, make submissions to us on what they think might need to be done in the constitution. And we, importantly, we are taking the, the, the work done by the Wooding Commission, the Hayatali Commission, the Principles of Fairness Draft Constitution, the Ellis Clark Draft Constitution of 2009, and the Ramadan Committee report, and we are taking all of that into consideration as we produce our report. But this exercise of going out to the, the, the population through these consultations that we are having all around the country in each regional corporation is to enable uh, the population to give voice to their, 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 their views on constitutional reform. You'll have the opportunity here to articulate what you think needs to be done and to perhaps explain some of the rationale and the reasons why you want those particular uh, reforms done. So essentially, that's the background to this committee. Uh, as the chairman pointed out, it is going to lead to uh, a conference of the population sometime in uh, June or later on this year. Hopefully, it's going to be uh, earlier rather than, than later in which uh, the, the, the working document that we produce will be the working document for that uh, conference, and at, that would be the point in time where the population will decide on what particular kind of constitution that they want. So we look forward to getting your views here this evening, and uh, with that, let me turn it over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Farrell. I hope that you all are hearing me. The mic um, proving to be a challenge because of my height. Mr. Barindra Sinanan, SC. 
other members of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, members of the Princess Town, and I want to say the word family because in Princess Town we are all one big family. Good night, my name is Petronella Baste, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. First of all, let me express our thanks on behalf of the members of Princess Town to the committee for being with us this afternoon and for inviting us um, to be part of the national contribution to constitutional reform. Let me take this opportunity to introduce um, members of the committee. Unfortunately, some of the members are absent and they have sent their apologies. We have Mr. Barindra Sinanathan, SC, Chairman of the National Advisory Committee and former Speaker of the House. And that is just one of the many hats that Mr. Sinanan wears. We have Mr. Terence Farrell, also an attorney at law and a former governor of the Central Bank. He too has many other hats that if I go to mention tonight, we will spend most of the night doing so. Ms. Jackie Sampson Miguel, attorney at law and former clerk of the House. Mr. Winston Rudder, Chairman of the Public Service Commission and former Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fishery. Ms. Helen Drayton, former Independent Senator, who unfortunately is absent tonight. Mr. Sandy, former Chairman, Chief Administrator of the Tobago House of Assembly and former Permanent Secretary. Ms. Heyman Arain Singh, Consulting Manager, Partner, EY Caribbean, Unfortunately, she too is absent tonight. And Mr. No Stranger to Princess Town, Mr. Nizam Mohammed, attorney at law and former Speaker of the House. All of the members before you have made significant contribution to Trinidad and Tobago, and they have been part of many important discussions today, and we welcome them to Princess Town. Now, we all know why we are here this afternoon. Um, I just want to remind our members who um, want to make a contribution this afternoon um, of the need to be respectful. This is a discussion. We may have differences of opinions, but that doesn't mean that we have to express them with any degree of disrespect. We can be as forceful as we want, but let us not give Princess Tung a bad name in our discussion. If we disagree, that is why we are here. That is part of what a discussion is, an exchange of ideas. Sometimes we agree with what is said, and sometimes we disagree. I, we appreciate that your contribution is invaluable, but we ask you to also appreciate that there is a time limit in which the committee is here. So we will have to unfortunately restrict contributions to five minutes per contribution. That does not mean that you will get a second opportunity if time permits. Um, before you make your contribution, if you wish to make a contribution, um, you can either do so by show of hands or approach the mic. Um, you will introduce yourself, you'll give us your name, and you'll indicate the general area from which you come from. Anybody who has a difficulty in coming to the mic, raise your hand and we will bring the mic to you. We are here to facilitate everyone. So I now open the floor to question and answers. Good night. Good night to the head table. Uh, a very, what I could say, a very experienced head table in the sense of um, the, contribution made to the, the contributions made to the country. Um, my name is Brennan Daniel. I am from the general area St. Mary's Moruga. I live at Gomez Street, St. Mary's Moruga. Um, I really want to speak on the issue of um, constitutional reform in the sense of whereas I did the questionnaire 
and they spoke about the CCJ replacing the Privy Council, right? And on the matter of um, the judicial system having a time frame whereas matters before the court. Um, I was an ex petrician employee, and uh, this constitutional reform gave me a chance to do a lot of things in the sense that I did a lot of freedom of information, whereas when I was sent home, I was sent home at the age of 50. And to today, it is bittersweet in the sense that I have loans outstanding, I was not re-employed as a permanent employee, I am in receipt of a deferred pension of $1,263 a month. I don't know how that calculation was done. I cannot pay my bills. Right now I am owing a credit union over $600,000 cannot pay my bills. Every day, that is incurring an interest. That is interfering with my credit rating. And I have no control over that interfering with my credit rating. I live in a HDC house which I haven't paid for for four years. $1,263 dollars, I don't know how that could work for me. In between that five years and something that I've been home, I've gotten work like with, well, they must basically, but it's on things like shutdown. So that is <laughs> seasonal work as we call it, right? But the problem I am having that I come tonight to speak about is the power of politicians, political entities, right? Um, the Attorney General, right? I feel the Constitution is supposed to be reformed to deal with things like this. I feel somehow I'm trying to work it out. How can we remove the Attorney General office from being a political entity because through the freedom of information I've done, I will give a perspective on what has happened. Our present sitting attorney general, he was the lead advocate for Petrochin in the matters with Petrochin against the OWTU. On the 19th of November, 2018, that is before the closure of Petrochin, the industrial court handed down a judgment, right, in favor of the OWTU. Whereas, they gave six days between the 20th and the 26th of November, because the closure of the company was on the 30th of November for the company and the union to go and sit down and work out and work out proper packages for the workers they were sending home. And these things were like your pension, your medical, right, um, your savings plan, what will be the new the structure, the new companies, what will be the rehiring process, and the main thing in that was the workers' loans. The company under the present Attorney General appealed that matter on the 19th of November, 2018. From that day to this day, that appeal has not been heard in the Court of Appeal. That is five years five months. None of the matters 
cannot go forward in the industrial court unless that appeal is heard in the court of appeal. Fast forward to today. The lead advocate, which, which is the sitting attorney general now, he attained the office of attorney general. Political again. That is why I feel the attorney general office have to be removed as a political entity. He now gets in the same matter he appealed. I have documentation of all these things through freedom of information. He gets in the said matter he appealed. He said the, the industrial court erred on this and erred on that. So he now gets in the same matter he appealed. The same court that he appealed their judgment, the industrial court, granted him leave to get in the matter as an interested party to bring remedies to the matter. Every day I wake up, tears run out of my eyes because of what was done to me and what was told to the wider Trinidad and Tobago. And it was nothing like that. So today, this, this man has the power to get into the matter. The matter will be on the 22nd of April. That is Monday coming. Right? So he has the power to get into this matter now, to do the biddings, or to finish destroy me as the government see it fit. Isn't that a conflict of interest? Isn't that... Is, <laughs> ah. We understand your emotions. And let me see if I, I get your question correct. Your question is, um, you're asking about reform for the Attorney General to be not politically influenced? No, I don't feel that's supposed to be a political... Is that what, is, is yes. that what you are saying? Yes. Because, as we could see, it is clear as daylight. It is as clear as daylight. Right? Okay. In another jurisdiction... So I'll have to limit you on your first question because yes. I have allowed... Um, in excess of the five minutes. Okay. And um, if time permits, of course, we will allow you to come back. Yes, so no problem. We would want to have everybody to at least make one contribution. No problem. And um, if there is time afterwards, of course, we will call upon you. Thank no you very much. No problem. Good night, everyone. Um, all protocols observed. Um, my name is Radley Ramdan, and I am a resident of St. Julian Village. So I'm basically very local to the area that we're in right now. And welcome to each and every one from the head table here, and to all those who will be listening to the recording after. Thank you all for taking the opportunity to come to Princess Town. So I'd like to start off my contribution with a little bit of advice that I got when I was in student government a couple of years ago in my undergrad. Um, our advisor came in on the first day of our um, meeting and he said, everyone ends up at the table either by a seat at the table or to be the food on the table. And the second uh, piece of advice he gave was that change can only be affected by those who show up. So with that being said, um, having you all come here give us an opportunity to be, become part of that table, but be on the seat as opposed to being the food on the table. So I appreciate that you all taking that time out to come. Um, some of my recommendations I've already submitted online. 
but I'm just going to run through a couple of them really quickly. So one suggestion is voting for president and vice president in elections, limiting the terms to a two-year term, fixed dates for presidential and local government elections. So every four years, there should be one set date that both of those elections should be held, similar to how it is in the US, where it's the first Tuesday in November of an election year. That is the election date every four years. So having something similar to that would help us to keep that fixed date idea. Senators should be appointed based on proportional representation as opposed to the current way that it is distributed. I think this would give us an opportunity to basically have a more general and a more balanced type Senate. I think with um, my suggestion would be having 36 senators um, for 36 senators based on the proportional representation aspect of it from the general election, then four independent senators, and the vice president would be the president of the Senate which would account for 41 members. So that would be similar to how we would have 41 MPs. Then also allowing for referendum voting. I know CCJ has been something that has been sort of a hot topic on the burner. I think referendum would be something that the CCJ um, and that court of appeal should be done by the people as opposed to having a smaller group of people make that decision. So I think having referendum vote, vote in for something like that will be a little bit more beneficial and get a wider um, view from the population of where their stance is on such a topic. I think with referendum, it should be allocated with any type of major decisions that has to be done um, by the government, including major policy issues, even um, issues with government performance, ministers' performances, MP performances, I think a referendum system should be in place to hold people a little bit more accountable, especially those who hold the higher offices. My suggestion was that 2% of the registered voters in that specific area, so if it's a recall on an MP per se, 2% of the registered voters would be what would it, it would take to initiate that type of referendum. Then it would go to the president and make that decision whether it's a viable thing or not. Um, same thing with any type of major policy issues. If somebody decides that we want, say for example, a member of the public says that we don't agree that CCJ should be the last court of appeal and we want to keep the Privy Council, then that should be something that is signed by 2% of the population and then sent to the president to decide on the date of voting. I think with referendum, we should also make it an opportunity where it's a set date every year that would be effected if it's needed. So for example, similarly, if you say the first Monday in January or the first Monday in February every year is our referendum date, then if there is a policy that we need to vote on, then we have that set date that we do it. Um, keep the option open also as potential for either um, where the referendum voting is mailed out and it has to be returned to EBC office. Um, you could have like a time schedule of like one week where the registered voter has to come in. Just like how you would come in and cast your ballot on election day, you would have a one week period where you have to come to the EBC office or designated locations to vote for referendum um, in that way. I think local government um, reform should become part of the constitution. I think the separation between cities, um, boroughs, and regional corporations, that should become something that is one across the board. And we should all have the same designation. One, the lead of the corporation should just be titled mayor across the board. Um, president should also have the opportunity to appoint one um, independent alderman when it comes to local government election that could act as an independent voice for people within uh, a regional corporation. Um, because a lot of times you see where there is some degree of imbalance when it comes to, even with 
the idea of proportional representation when it comes to selecting alderman. But if we have an independent alderman, then people may feel more confident going to that independent alderman as opposed to going to a UNC alderman or a PNM alderman to ask for help when it comes to raising issues in the local government forum. Prime Minister should also be allowed a maximum of two terms, and that two terms should not just be two five-year terms, it should be two terms of whatever election term it is. So if for whatever reason a Prime Minister has to call election early and serves a two-year term and a five-year term, after that, that's it. It should be no five, two five-year term limit, because I saw that as one of the questions on the questionnaire. Um, also, one thing that I would like to see in the Constitution is something that protects the financial assets of the taxpayers, right? I think that lawsuits against government officials, offices, organizations should not fall on taxpayers, but it should have some percentage of that falling on the individual that is being sued. Because a lot of time you hear everybody saying, sue the Minister of Education, sue the Minister of Health, sue the chairman of a government board or a state board, and that financial burden falls back on the taxpayers. It doesn't fall on the individual. So I think if we put something in the Constitution, that would be able to help the members of the community, the taxpayers, feel a little bit more comfortable with things like that. Also, in terms of constitutional protection with financial assets, I think, again, going back to the idea of referendum, having idea, things like closing down Petrotrin, Kearney, any state-run um, state, um, organizations, I think that should be something that referendum voting should be done with because it gives you an opportunity to get a wider perspective, again, as opposed to a smaller collective group making that decision. Another contribution I have is that the, there should be a limit to the number of ministers. Um, I think there should be a minimum and a maximum number of ministers that are allocated in every government. Um, per se, 15 minimum and 20 maximum. And then I saw the um, moderator standing. So I have one last contribution, and that is that the Constitution should also protect the environment. I saw that that is also part of the question, I believe. Um, but that should also expand to protecting our local herbs, our local plants, things like that as well when it comes to protecting the environment. Because when it, that, all those things that we grow here locally, some aspect of it we do have an opportunity to, to utilize um, where we could protect that um, the, the way that it is used and the way that it is um, broadcast all around the world. Things like, um, say for example, an herb that we grow locally or grows locally, if we have the intellectual property protection of it, basically, then that would allow us to have a little bit more power with people taking our local herbs and marketing it on the outside and the taxpayers of Trinidad not really benefiting from it. So. With that being said, I want to say thank you again for allowing me this opportunity to share my contributions. Thank you for your contribution. You can remain seated. You can remain seated. Okay. <clears throat> good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening, Madam Moderator. And of course, to the Chairman of the Constitution, uh, Constitutional Reform Committee here and other members. Um, welcome to Princess Tong. I'm very happy to be here this, this evening as a citizen of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. This being our fifth attempt to bring up ideas and suggestions to reform and to fix our constitution in a way that citizens will be much happier and we'll be, more, we'll be able to work and enjoy a better quality of life. I think I am very happy to be here to be part of this historic and very significant opportunity um, 
I am cautiously optimistic that um, this time around, something is going to happen. And because of that, I am present here this evening. I also want to commend the authorities. I see uh, uh, included on the panel, we have two uh, former speakers of the, the parliament and members of parliament um, from different backgrounds. And this is so very good. And I think it augurs well for the work of the committee. And all of the members of the committee, Dr. Farrell and Mr. Roda, I must say a special welcome to Mr. Roda. For those who don't know, he is a former Princess Tong citizen. So all in all, it is a very, very important uh, occasion here this evening, very significant, that we as ordinary citizens have this opportunity to participate and to share our ideas and our comments in the hope that something tangible will come out of the whole exercise. Having said that, Madam Moderator, my first item is proportional representation. Oh, sorry. Deunarain Ragu, uh, I live at Matilda Road, Princess Town. Yeah, at the top of my list, it is proportional representation. Reason being, I am asserting that the time has come when we must look at democracy and the constitution, not only in the context of first past the post and numbers, we now have to convert those numbers into people. Democracy is about people. Yes, we have the, the rules and the law and so on. But the main component of democracy is people, the citizens of the republic. And as we have been often told, the most precious resort, resource of any nation is our human resource. Hence, our politics, our, govern, our constitution over the years have influenced our politics in this first past the post system, which did never really brought out the best of our citizens. And I think the time has come when we must seriously review this, this uh, first past the post system and really move towards proportional representation. If Trinidad and Tobago, as we all agree and accept, and as Desmond Tutu, that South African archbishop told us, that Trinidad and Tobago is a rainbow country made up of so many different cultures and religions and races and so many interests, then the time has come when we must fashion and establish institutions and, and constitution that is reflective of the dreams, the hopes, the wishes, the aspirations of all our citizens. And if we do that, I think the citizens' will, lives will be greatly enhanced and enriched, and it will be an incentive for even more citizens to participate in the democratic process. Every vote must have a value, must be important. We have had several elections where seats have been lost and won by one vote, two vote, three votes, small numbers. In addition, you would recall, uh, Madam Moderator, that in 1981, the ONR got 91,000 votes and didn't win one seat. In 1981, sorry. In 1991, the NAR got 128,000 votes and still didn't win a seat. And in 2007, the Congress of the People got 147,000 votes and not one seat. This cannot be correct. It cannot be fair. What this has done is alienated and isolated thousands of citizens from that whole democratic process, from seriously participating in the governance process. And therefore, I am pleading with you, members of the panel, to please make a very strong representation for proportional representation similar to what we have in Guyana it is working well I'm not saying it might be perfect but it is working well and I think the nation will be far better off with proportional representation my second point madam moderator is the selection and or election of the speaker of the house 
and the president of the Senate. I am suggesting that we establish an electoral college, similar to what is used for the president, but expand that electoral college to include all local government representatives and the Tobago House of Assembly. In this way, that process again will be opened up to a wider participation and might be better reflective of a wider cross-section of the population, thereby enhancing the concept and the philosophy of being independent. Members may feel a little more comfortable, perhaps, in voting in different to their party instructions or party lines and so on. And I think that system will turn up a, a better choice, at least will give us a better chance of fairness in the conduct of the parliament in terms of the Senate and the parliament. My third point is referendum. That has been mentioned. It has been on online, and everybody is talking about it. So I just want to support the call for referendum. And just to add, this is one way, again, of empowering citizens. We cannot talk about citizens' participation and all the high virtues and so on and not put constitutional measures in place to facilitate the, the participation of citizens in that democratic process. And thereby, the referendum system is one system which can be used to um, allow citizens that opportunity to participate on very serious and controversial matters of state with dealing with the law. Prime Minister, I agree, two terms limit for the Prime Minister. Again, we want persons to evolve. We have lots of talent in the country and in the political parties and so on. And we, we don't want to have a situation where this kind of a domination, you know, the Prime Minister is a very, very powerful office in this land. In fact, I would say too powerful. And that is something we need to look at. The next point is the powers of the president. I think the time has come when we must do away with ceremonial president. This is serious business. The world and everything is, I mean, the world is, is in crisis right now. And we want to have serious governance. The president should be somebody with at least some kind of powers. Some kind of powers that you will be able to call to account even the prime minister or the government or senior civil servants, etc., etc. We want, we could work out those details, but we want a president with some powers that will be able to be like a check, a serious check and balance on, on, the, on the governance process in the country. Mr. Ragu, thank you very much. I am hoping that we would have some time later on so that you can continue the, your contribution. I just have about three more. Of course, we Thanks. would want to allow other members. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much for your contribution. Is there anyone else that would like to have their voice heard? For those who came in late, I remind you that we allow a 15 minutes per contribution, a uh, five yeah. minutes, sorry, per minutes. contribution. <laughs> and we ask you to give your name and the general area from which you come. We will allow you a second opportunity if time permits. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, good e and my name is Mickey Matthews and good evening to the panel. I want to make one adjustment to the arrangement here. I, I need to address the, um, the, the members here, the people who are here. I want to face them. And, and is, would you permit me that? I need to face, I want to face the audience. I come to speak to them. Feel comfortable, but right. don't um, turn your back to the, well, to the panel, well, so you can you turn from the side. We ask that you don't move the mic so you can remain right, right. here. <laughs> yes, uh, brothers and sisters, I have been involved in this exercise of constitution reform from since the existence of the Wooding Commission, and I've learned a lot. And I have, I want to say one more thing. 
the last conference I, I, I participated in, I call it the Prakash Commission, uh, on the table, there were um, templates of the names of the commissioners. And I remember somebody who had experienced the exercise of constitution abroad, of reform abroad, said he, he thought that was intimidating. He thought, he thought the, they thought that the, uh, the arrangement of the commissioners should be just as it is here. No name, nothing to intimidate the, um, the audience. I, I had a conflict then with uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Prakash, who sat as chairman of the, of, the, um, of the exercise, and I told him that he was intimidating the discussion. He was stifling the discussion. Anyway, none of that is happening here, and I want to thank you all for that. Now, <laughs> I, I want to bring some politics into the issue. I told um, I, I know you were in Tobago, and there is, some people think that the, the, the issue of home rule for Tobago or the issue over Tobago could be solved by, by um, what do you call it, um, what, what, uh, uh, oh Lord, it was escaping me. The government's getting together as, you know, the both countries existing as independence unit and getting together as a, as a, a national government. And I told them, that, listen, that can only take place for, um, if you have national parties. If you have a Tobago party and a Trinidad party contesting the election, you're not going to have a federal government. That's the word. That's what I'm looking for. And I also want to say that you're not going to have constitutional reform if you don't reform the parties. And that I have little ambition for this exercise, more than the fact it's an exercise in self-education. It's amazing what we don't know about the Constitution. You read in the papers up to date. I mean, the journalists are saying, election is due in a year and a half time, by November or sometime next year, at the most. And the fact is, election is due any time. That's the constitutional law. You could call an election any time. And you always got to prepare for it. So this, this exercise ought to be one of learning for everybody, including myself. And the issue I want to, to address this evening, which I think you, you, you need some enlightenment on, is the Caribbean Court of Justice. Now, when the Caribbean Court was established, Pandey was the prime minister at the time. The late Basil Pandey was the prime minister of the, of the time. And he agreed. He agreed to the setting up of, of this, uh, this um, regional court and that we wouldn't have to go to the Privy Council and so on. And you know what made him change his mind? What made him change his mind was the way President Robinson decided to settle, to break the tie. There was a tie election in 2001, is it, or 2002? 2002. 1818, both sides had. And the president had to intervene, but he couldn't intervene really. But the, the thing had to be solved. And, and Robinson decided to give the government to Mr. Manning on the basis of spiritual value, values. In other words, saying Mr. Um, <coughs> Mr. Pa Mr. Manning had better spiritual values than Mr. Pandey. And almost implying that the Hindu community religious values were second to that of others, the dominant race or, the, or tribe. And I think that was offensive, deeply it was offensive to me. And it was offensive to all of Pandey's constituency. And he decided to retaliate. He had little means to retaliate. He himself had given Robinson, which he shouldn't have given, and Mr. Mr. Robinson shouldn't have take, taken, to make whatever decision you want. And if you make it, he'll go, he'll go, 
but the Constitution didn't allow, and the, and, the sense, and the sense of fairness in the politics didn't allow he to say that and Mr. Robinson to agree to it. And it hurt him. I suppose he expected Mr. Robinson to, to vote in his favor. He argued, he argued that he was the incumbent, <clears throat> and, um, and therefore if he decided that you have to give somebody the office, then it must be him. But he was wrong. A tie is a tie. And they had to form an, a national government. And if they did not form the national government, they had to go back to the polls. But the main thing, none of that happened. Robinson made a decision. Mr. Pandey retaliated against Mr. Pandey. And he said, we are not joining the Privy Council. Tell me if I'm wrong. That is what has happened. Right? So this resistance, of course, the, 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 the um, Central Trinidad has its own reservation about the, about, about the um, the, all the Court of Justice, the Caribbean Court of Justice, right? And, um, but Mr. Pandey had agreed, and they, and they did not disagree with him. They intended to go along. But he decided that he's not going along with it. This is the Afro-Saxon state displaying all this discrimination against my constituency. He's right. I think he was right. We're not going along with it. So, so what I'm telling you here, all this resistance to the Caribbean Court of Justice has little to do with justice. It is political justice, the unfairness of the system, which you see as Afro-Saxon prejudice. How dare he says that anybody else's spiritual value is superior to mine? And that's what, the, that's what, Robinson, that's, that's, that's what Robinson said, implied. Now, this is not going to be solved. This question of the Caribbean Court of Appeal is not to, going to be solved unless we settle that question of the tight elections and the way we settle it, right? We ha we ha uh, I see you said, are you going to stop me? I am going to give you a few seconds more. No, no, not, not a few seconds yet. Not uh, a few. I, but, I, yeah? My hands are tied. I, I, I need five more minutes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I need five more minutes. Uh, what about if I, I give you two more minutes and then no, we'll no, no, no. I, I just didn't meet everybody. I have popped in flying flight. I'm going to tell you, listen, this is important in the country. They want to know how to solve it. I, 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 right? unfortunately, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. because of the time constraints, I am constrained. There's nobody to talk, this. nobody's talking. You know, and man. of course, you'll get another opportunity. But let me finish this point. I'm insisting on it. Finish the point. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> no, there's a hurt in the country. I am telling you, this election is hurting. The country has come more divided since then. When I was a little boy, I know what division was. 1961 election, 56 and so on. And you could feel it in the campaign and so on. But we've come a long way since. We didn't have a government of national unity, NAR and so on. But that decision made by Robinson in 2001 fractured the country. It brings all our divisions back together again. So I'll have to ask you. Say, no, no, no. I'll have to ask you to stop. I am and going to. If you just only let me make, give me one minute. And I am I'm constrained by the... Give, I'll give you the one minute. The chairman has um, petitioned on your behalf. Half of the country. They don't display it everywhere. But if you open their hurt, that's how you see it. And the only way to resolve that is that we have to confront that issue again and somebody has to rise, particularly in the ranks of the PNM, to say Robinson was wrong. Manning was wrong. The only way, otherwise we'll have no Caribbean Court of Justice. I thank you. Thank you very much. Can somebody assist me by... Um Good night, everyone. I'm Eric Lewis, Chief of the First People's Sovereign Nations in Trinidad and Tobago and the Prince of Maruga. I'm also the President of the St. Vincent Ferrer Society, uh, Maruga Development Organization. We, we spoke so fast that we didn't get your name. I'm Eric Lewis, Prince of Maruga, Chief of the First Peoples, President of the St. Vincent Ferrer Society. Uh, founder of the Maruga Museum, founder of the National Cocoa and Chocolate Museum and Heritage Complex of Trinidad and Tobago, and um, also chair for the Maruga Tourism Organization. And the reason why I make sure and say all these things, it's to, in relation to my points. 
<clears throat> Over the years, the indigenous community has have had uh, little and no representation at the parliamentary level. And whenever there are ceremonial activities, you see all the other cultures represented, or East Indian culture, African culture, and you know, in some cases, you see the Chinese culture and at the diplomatic forums, you see all the different ambassadors from all the different parts of the world represented at our countries, at Trinidad and Tobago, highest functions and ceremonies. And at most times, the indigenous community is left out and very little or no recognition at all or no invitation would be sent to us. Whether it's Arima, Maruga, or San Fernando, or Superior, none of the indigenous groups are, are you know, represented or held at the forefront. In a lot of our countries, on, on, in Trinidad and Tobago's affairs, and that's something that I hope that constitutional reform would in, include. So be it resolved that representation of the first peoples of this land, the indigenous community, at an independent, independent level, at, parliament for, at the parliament be granted in some way, equitable constitutional rights in relation to representation of our indigenous identity, our indigenous uh, issues and problems and causes uh, and, and, and you know, situations be taken at a parliament level, parliamentary level. And also a holiday that marks the, the indigenous presence or indigenous awareness. Could you imagine the first peoples in this country, which is originally, everybody know, in, in, uh, uh, primarily at first inhabited by what you all call the Caribs and Arawaks. We still don't have a holiday. Is that right? Is that, equi is that equitable? Is it equal? That every creed and race finds an equal place and that still the first people's community still does not have a place on its own lands inhabited by many other cultures and people, which we welcome, which we celebrate, which I'm also descended of all these different cultures. And in relation to uh, rural communities, when you look at places like Maruga, well, as Prince of Maruga, now I have to also speak about that. When you look at places like Maruga, which has uh, one of the country's earliest historical, you know, significance to, of impact, right? And I'm saying that in relation to the indigenous community, and then you have Columbus, and then you have Christianity, and you have so many other things that would have started in Maruga, uh, or in the Maruga ward, right? And then you look at Maruga, 500 years later, we look almost the same. We look almost the same. I mean, a lot, some of it might have to do with the people, the, you know, saying, okay, the people need to develop themselves. But it's, there's only so much that the people could do to develop themselves where, you know, resources are concerned. We still can't fix our own roads. We still can't build our own uh, health facilities or build a fire station, etc. And over the years, you st we still st suffer from the lack of everything that you would read in a historical book from 100 years ago or 150 years ago. We still have those same ident exact problems. I mean, coming from the museum's archive. You know, so if rural communities could have uh, you know, some kind of upgrade, some sort of uh, better representation. I'm, I'm not just speaking about uh, you know, minister and uh, a minister of parliament because you're going to see some really good projects started. And I don't even want to get into that because I don't want to get into the political PNM, UNC thing, you know. And um, you would see some really, really good things going across the country and then you see things cut, not just in Marugalun, but even when you go down to Penal, DBAC, a multi-million dollar investment. Who, who is responsible for the continuation and the completion of all of these things in our country that the taxpayer, which is us, we, the people, uh, it's our money that's spending there. And then to, to, to a greater extent, little and no, no, nobody takes responsibility for that. You have the university there at um, Penal Debe, it's beautiful. You have the fire station there. You have some uh, the Maruga agro-processing, which is still not functional as it's supposed to in any way, but it's, it looks good, it sounds good. The Maruga fishing facility is coming up here now. We were supposed to have a deep water harbor project. It is not, you know, I'm, I, have been, I have been part of the consultation, and at the same time, the consultation, when, when we the people say, okay, this is what we want, we'd like it to be like this. 
oh yeah, it's promised. And then it, then it, take, then it goes down, you go down the road and it takes an entire about turn and it does not fulfill its means to the ends. And when things don't fulfill the means to its ends, what happens? You end up with a big colossal building without, uh, the, without, without it being efficiently and effectively used. And um, I just want to draw something to the attention of the table and everyone. Murugan used to have a magistrate's courthouse, and I'm not just speaking about Murugan alone, but I want you to understand where we are at as a people. We are still called, uh, right, a magistrate courthouse. We used to have a warden's office since the early 1900s. You know that was removed from Murugan? We used to also have a bus station as well. The magistrate courthouse has been closed down completely. The warden's office closed down, removed, and Maruga, in, um, a lot of Maruga people have a lot of land. Maruga might be a small place uh, per capita by number of persons living in that place, but a lot of families own huge parcels. And if we, can, if we are doing that, if that's happening without consultation, without the people's involvement, we are technically demoting the community. So if, they, if we can now rebrand what we call villages, because people still refer to Maruga as a village. You know there's a definition of a village, it has a certain number of people and a certain number of um, things. But now we have grown, the numbers have grown in different parts of the country. How have we upgraded different parts of the country where places are supposed to be? Towns now, or little boroughs, or so on, you know? So that would be my contribution for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Do we have any more contributions? in this crowd here today. I am disappointed in the people of Princess Town. When I ask some of my friends to come, they say, nah, they're not coming, it's a political gimmick. However, that being so, we have a duty to motivate who might want to come. Dr. Farrell, you indicated that you use all modern technologies. However, in these areas, 90% of the people don't use it. And therefore, it may be necessary that we ad adjust and adapt our style and content of these meetings to motivate people to come. So <clears throat> I would humbly suggest, like um, Dr. Farrell, I had been to the Prakash from Hada, um, and my little friend um, there, to their um, consultation, and they got the same stick that we are getting here, in that people say, well, you can't make me coming. But we have to make sure that we get the people out. I humbly submit, <coughs> most humbly, I humbly submit, that <coughs> what we could do is to take one or two or some ideas from the um, Prakash uh, Ramada, um, Commission, and I have some that I will to pass on to the um, table, the table. And we <clears throat> discuss the things we have discussed, one point or two points. Put it in a spreadsheet and probably produ produce it in newspaper, or if we have the funds, to put it in, uh, in the post and let everyone uh, go to every person. So we would have done more than we should have done. We should do, sorry. I humbly submit that maybe, <clears throat> I'll be rude to say this early, that we probably suspend the meeting or adjust the meeting to a, longer, a little longer date, go through the, the various um, presentations have been, which have been produced, put point forms on it, and encourage people to go forward. Also, Mr. <clears throat> Madam <clears throat> Moderator, that will help the people who are coming to have something upon which to work. 
so that when we come here, we wouldn't waste the committee's time. And we will take the points which are in writing and build on those so that we will not be saying the same thing over and over, but we will be projecting something new and newer. And that might be um, a motivation for the people to come. Also, <clears throat> we need to go to the schools, the form, the form six schools and things, and give out, give out um, pamphlets so that people would have no excuse to say they're not coming. So I humbly suggest that as a slight um, remark and um, hope, and to say, I cast no aspersions at anyone. <clears throat> Dr. Farrell, you indicated that it was a hush or a hurried constitution that the British imposed upon us at the Marlborough House. But you know what they did? It was so hurriedly done that they take the worst parts of what they have uh, 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 in their, their unwritten constitution and they impose it on us. For example, today I like to um, address one issue, and I wish I had wished to speak last because it might be boring to some people. The, there's a question. Issue of the removal of the Privy Council and um, the introduction of the CCJ as our final court of appeal. The most profound statement that has been made on this issue is that of the Director of Public Persecution. When he said, right, he says that in the context of selling. I use the word loosely, the idea of the CCJ, we must have, and I wish to say, I'm quoting from the Guardian of the 13th of this month. So I don't want to plagiarize. Um, yes. Yeah, the existence concerning the, full, okay, hold on. He says, if we preoccupy ourselves with the esoteric and perhaps the abstruse, notions containing, concerning the philosophical rationale for the existence of the CCG as our final court of appeal without making delivery of justice more wholesome and available to the man on the street or the, the, the man on the ground, we may be engaging in a parody. I want to humbly submit that is the most profound statement I've heard um, on the making the CCJ the final court of appeal. As I say, the British give us the worst on independence. In England, they have the judiciary divided, the CJ, or Lord Chief Justice, or Lord Chancellor, and the sittings and decisions of the, 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 the dark judges cannot be questioned in any court or any parliament. But the other workings of the judiciary could be contested among the people. In Trinidad, the officers are fused. And when they are fused, we can't talk about it. Nothing. If you see anything wrong, apart from decisions, you can't talk. We have good, two good speakers here who would, if I may speak and tell me, we cannot discuss the judiciary in the parliament unless there's a substantive motion on the judiciary. And we are, or you are, sorry, they are the elected people and they can find out how the money is spending and which direction we are going into. So I humbly submit <coughs> that we must make the poor man have a stake in the justice system, and when that has been achieved, go, then go to the Privy Council. Time up? Sorry. Okay. The, Mr. Mr. Speaker, you're better than when you're in Parliament. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, I humbly submit <coughs> that the judiciary here be divided. I submit 
that the CJ deals with all things about cases, sitting, develop the jurisprudence. That must not be questioned in any court. I humbly submit also that we should establish another limb of the judicial system there, where you have something akin to the chancellor. And if there is anything outside sitting at the court, the chancellor has to answer. And what is strange, lady, lady and gentlemen, they have made, although they have an unwritten constitution, they have made a number of amendments to their laws to move it forward, to make justice available to the poor, to make the man on the street feel he has a stake in justice. We can't do that here. You can't do anything at all. So maybe the functions of the chancellor, the person, the kind of chancellor, must be the administration of the judiciary. And he must be accountable in the parliament as to how the monies have been spent in the judiciary. And he could be accountable, maybe to a joint select committee of the parliament. And if that is done, I'm certain that people will feel a sense of belonging. I'll tell you something here tonight. You know, without any knowledge, they close down the mayoral court. They close down the real clerical court. So if you live in Guaya, and you take a bus 4 o'clock in the morning in Guaya, the first bus in the Guaya, you reach in Rio Clara 11 o'clock. We have been there, and we, see, we saw it work. So that poor people from Braguari will have to spend money to come Miaro. Then they'll have to pay money to come Rio Claro. Then they'll pay money again to come to Princess Town. Because they said, in Princess Town, we're making the system more efficient. Court one is Princess Town, court two is Rio Claro, and court three is Miaro. What's the position of the poor man? What is the problem? And nobody knew about it, and they just prayed it as a surprise. That, hum I humbly submit, the poor man must be told about that. That must be in the public purview before such changes take place. But that, if you think that is funny, they take the children's court and put it in Faisabad. Faisabad is the most out of the way place you could find. So take this man from, from Guaya. He will have to spend $100 a day to go and the next 100 to come. It's in those circumstances, people feel that they don't have a stick in the justice system. And we need to take steps to deal with that. Before we even think about dealing with the people council, we must deal with these problems in our own judiciary, make our people feel there's a stake in our own justice system before we talk about removing the people council and bringing the CCG. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Bandi. Um, I will continue if there's time afterwards. Is there anyone, anyone else? Because if we don't, Mr. Pandey might take the mic again. So, do we have any more contributions? Tell us your name and from which area you okay, come from night. and you have five minutes to make your contribution. Hi, good night everybody. I feel like I don't need the mic, but uh, my name is Dafina Tyson. I live Fairfield in Princess Town. Um, so come I was closer to the mic. Can I hold it? Right, so my name is Dafina Tyson. I live Fairfield, Princess Town, and I don't want to be recorded. But um, <laughs> I came here tonight just to see what it was about. I wasn't too sure. Um, I wasn't too sure if even my contribution, if this was the forum, but I read the flyer and I felt, you know, the need to come and say what I have to say. So I have a five-year-old son who is at primary school age. He is autistic, which is a developmental disability. Even though our education policy claims to be inclusive, it is not. So that him going to a public school is, it don't make sense at this point. Yes, he gets a disability grant, but I feel as though 
you know, he has a right to an education. He has a right to have a chance to be a contributing member to this society. And he can't if he can't get an education. So right now I do pay for him to go to private school, right? It's a juggle every month to be able to pay the fee, right? I am grateful for the, for the assistance that I do get from the government, but it's, you know, it's just a drop in the bucket. So that I, I am asking, and it's something that I actually wrote a letter to the Minister of Finance. I do, again, I don't know if that was the right forum. To look at more creative ways to support, especially the quote-unquote middle class. So that I don't make enough to get a certain level of assistance, which is fair, which is fine, I understand. However, the additional cost that I now incur, which again, I don't mind as my child. But if I could get, if we because I'm in a parent group with a lot of other parents of autistic children, and it's the same, you know, it's the same stories a lot of us have. You know, tax breaks. Can we get tax exemption from certain things? A lot of autistic and other developmental disabilities, they come with comorbidities. It could be ADHD. Um, a lot of kids are picky eaters, so they can't eat. You know, we try to shop, go in the market, buy what's cheap, but they just don't eat it supplements, vitamins, these things I might order online. They're not available here, so that when I order it online, I still have to pay online tax. I still have to pay whatever tax to clear it. Like, I'm just asking if we could look at more creative ways to provide assistance to families of children and even adults with developmental disabilities, because at the end of the day, how I see it is that you should want, or the government or whoever should want to support us to support our children to be productive members of society. I don't want to have to think that my child is going to be a burden to the state or to the government for the rest of his life, right? I have the opportunity now to do everything in my power to, to help him be all that he could be. I'm just asking for a little more assistance or more creative ways to be assisted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have anybody else who wish to add their contribution? If, if not, uh, let me ask Mr. Ragu to, he indicated that he had one more contribution unless there's someone else. I'm sure Mr. Ragu wouldn't take, um, we wouldn't be as generous as the five minutes because um, we are about to close, so maybe we will. I apologize after we will allow the first speaker um, his opportunity. I do humbly apologize. It was just that. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Again, quickly, um, I want to support the call for some kind of limit on, on the size of the cabinet. There, there's a cost factors in terms of management, et cetera, et cetera. And you cannot have a situation where if you win 28 or 29 seats, you share out ministries like as though it's some barbecue or something. It's, it's a very heavy cost to the population in terms of reorganizing ministries, permanent secretary staffing, physical accommodation, etc. And when governments change and so on, the, the whole process has to be re, uh, repeated and reorganized, and that is a very um, costly factor. And when you look at the size of our population, many uh, countries around the world with bigger populations than Trinidad have smaller cabinets than us. The other point I, I wish to make is the service commission stool. Something should be done to, to implement or introduce some kind of system which is more efficient and effective. Clearly, the service commission in, in, in the country, in the current uh, configuration, has failed in terms of management and and, and monitoring and, and efficiency and effectiveness. And this is something we must look at very, very closely. And lastly, crime. I want to assert that this crime problem in Trinidad and Tobago is a very serious problem, unprecedented. And if we as a population via the Constitution do not put measures in place where we can deal with it from a legal point of view, then we are in serious, we have an, we are in even more trouble. 
And I am saying, if even there has to be some kind of sunset clause arrangement, temporarily or whatever it is, we need to bring or have legislation in place that could confront the minority criminal element, these, these miscreants which are reaping havoc on the lives of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And one of the suggestions I want to make is that we seriously consider uh, activating the, 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 the death penalty and secondly, flogging for criminals. We have got to make that separation. If you do the crime, you must do the time and pay those penalties. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much. First speaker. Good night again to the head table. And good night again to everybody inside. Um, sticking to the same point, right? Um, Caribbean Court of Justice. Yeah, the Caribbean Court of Justice and time limit on matters. I may use a word here tonight that some might not like how it's wrong, but what I want to say is um, I feel the judicial system needs to be revamped because I feel that every aspect of it has been compromised, right? Um, how will constitutional reform combat rogue appointments that is clearly placed there to appease political, the political directorate while doing grave injustice to citizens, right? Because at the end of the day, that is what you're seeing that is taking place in our country. It, I will say that um, you could twin that with crime in the sense that they both work in tandem with each other. Right? Um, again, I want to state something has to be done Whereas the office of the attorney general, right? I don't know if you, are, you could leave the attorney general um, independent and the government that is in power has some, some judicial person that will represent them. But a lot of times you will see that the office of the attorney general, they will, um, <clears throat> sorry, they will follow cue from the government, right? And this is something that, as I said earlier, myself and um, other ex petrochian employees, we are going through that right now. Because I cannot, in no uncertain terms, understand what is taking place right now with that matter, whereas the same person that appealed the matter for the company has now become the attorney general, and that person has got into, gotten into the appeal to bring remedies to the appeal when the industrial court brought remedies to the appeal, and this is the person that he appealed the remedies, right? So... I feel that, I feel that something need be done about this, right? I know you all are just um, a forum right now, you know, but it is going to the root of what could happen down the road, right? And as I was going to say earlier, they, they have respect in another jurisdiction because I think it's still in my memory. This same individual tried that in, a, in another jurisdiction just sometime last year. In a matter where he of himself was the lawyer and then he became attorney general and tried to get into the matter and he had was to walk away from the matter because of this said thing and look at happening 
So you're respecting that in another jurisdiction internationally. But you're coming and you're exercising your power in a jurisdiction in Trinidad and Tobago. So um, I will take my leave because others have something to say, but I, I hope something be done about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to give an opportunity to the Prince of Moruga to um, continue his contribution. Good night again. Eric Lewis, Prince of Moruga and Chief of the First Peoples. Apart from being involved in, the, uh, in those aspects, I'm also involved in the agricultural aspect of, you know, in my life and in my family's life. And um, also in property. If you look at some of our land laws, you would realize that our land laws really need to be updated, especially in rural areas. And you'd have properties along the roadside, and I'm, I'm, I know this because I have some properties. And when it's time to get, for you to get a subdivision, they will say, okay, you can't get a subdivision because this is um, old law or, or it belongs to the RPO, right? The Real Property Ordinance. And I mean, I've learned a lot just by the experience of it. And when you look at those laws, really and truly, I cannot see some of those property laws applicable to today in a developing society from the time of the Queen and the Crown lands and the Crown grants. We are no longer under a Crown. We are a republic and a, a republic nation where the citizens should have, you know, some better stance on that. I mean, I don't want to go too long and off topic, but... Um, that's one, one of the things, and um, you know, if, you, if, if the lands can't change to, if you can't get business property, uh, commu property upgraded to be, uh, commercial or even housing on a big 20-acre land, some of, in some of the properties in Moruga, you have like, it could be only subdivided into five-acre parcels or two-acre parcels. How are you going to have development? How are you going to have sustainability within communities? And I think as a people, as citizens, we should look at sustainability within communities where people don't have to always be running out of their community to get a job, to, to, to develop some, something, to open a new business, always has to be outside of your community, and that also creates brain drain from uh, smaller communities and rural areas. Um, and in the area of uh, the budget, right? When you listen to how the budget is red. It really sounds as if we're living in an autocratic society where one man decides everything and there's nothing, the, the poor man, as Mr. Ba uh, Pan, uh, Basileu said, there's nothing that the poor man could do about it when a lot of these, these things are going on in parliament. And you just have to sit there, look at the television or your phone or whatever means that you're collecting this information and just you know, swallow it, and there's nothing you can do. Do we really understand what it means to be a republic and independent where the citizens make the democratic decision in running a country or their state? And if we truly understand that, then the rights of democ democracy uh, is on the citizens, and even the citizenry is our next, you know, big term just used, you know, Sadly, in, 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 in our uh, legislation, it's not being uh, materialized in the way that it should. And another thing, uh, another area that I would also like to speak about is, um, you know, when you look at farmers who, who would have been using the, the, the state lands, let's go back to that, state lands and agricultural lands, uh, particularly like in places like I mean, in different parts of the country, you have that happening where uh, land occupants still do not have a land tenure or lease from the government or anything like that. You know, a hundred years ago, it was a lot easier. 2024, and it is more difficult where you have all these different ways that we could really, I mean, the government, the ministries could distribute these lands to these farmers and grant them their properties a lot easier. So, you know, this, this is the next thing that I wish that we could get some more involvement in. I mean, the, the state could get a little more involved in, in distributing these lands to these people. So you see some 60-year-old, 90-year-old people dying and like, okay, I haven't gotten a land tenure document yet. You know, that was something that I hope that constitutional reform would be able to assist in. 
um, and business laws and establishing of new business. If you go through the full process of establishing a new business in Trinidad, in terms of, um, let's see, so you go through the registry, and now when you go through that whole registry thing, it's a whole next longer, tedious process. And also if you have to have a new trademark, it takes two years here to establish a trademark in this country and to pattern a product. So what's going to happen at all that long time that you are planning, to, you have a great idea, you have something really good to bring out on the market so that you have more economic development in your country to contribute to the economic development of, uh, and international you know, export, etc., to bring in revenue. What's going to happen? You know what happens? Nothing. And then all that time goes, it lags and lags and lags. And then you get to the next ministry, they drop all these other requirements on you. You have Ministry of Health, which has its own world by itself. Uh, where business development is concerned, if you're bringing out, I'm just using a broad example, like a pepper sauce or, or some kind of new jam or something. And I'm also an inventor of chocolate rum, which Mr. Rudder knows well. And I'm still not able to get that on the market because of our country's alcohol laws, which still has not been updated since the 1800s, during the time of slavery. Why is Baba still illegal? You know what the ministry says? Because we don't know what goes in it, all right? So let, how about if you know what goes in it and we start a new process so that we could have more distillery in, con in the country and make these things legal so you have another form of what? Revenue for the country, of revenue for a community. Don't worry, I'm just conscious of my time. Sorry, I'm just trying to stick to the points, right? So the alcohol and liquor laws, if they could be advanced and updated, in other parts of the world, you're allowed to make, they call it moonshine, legally, you're allowed to do all of that. Why? So what's going on with us Caribbean people? We probably like rum too much, right? I only look at the alcohol. I mean, not, I'm not an alcoholic, right? But I mean, it's, I'm, a, I'm an inventor of chocolate rum, and my rum should already be out there on the market, on the international market. We had like 50,000 bottles order for different countries. We can't even produce one yet. It's illegal to do that. I mean, to sell it, I could just produce it, but I can't produce in any large amount. I could just have it as a, as a, um, what, as a sample, and it can't be sold. I mean, I'm just one person in that, but if we don't really update our laws, then we're not going to have creativity and development and, you know, in, in many aspects of our country life, where business is concerned, where land is concerned, where agriculture is concerned, where, is, where food processing is concerned, and I guess... We, if we really want to see uh, economic growth and stimulate that type of development, we need to really look at these laws that cramps that. Other countries in the Caribbean are inviting me to do business in their country. A lot easier. They say everything would be ready within months. In Trinidad, it's years still. So, you know, that is something that I really hope that could make a difference in, in those areas. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Pandey. Time appears to be on your side. So we will, Mr. Pandey, we will give you just a few Thank more you, minutes. Madam. Thank you. I was at the point of the appointment of judges. I humbly submit <clears throat> that a committee should be set up of permanent persons, experts, and persons from various organs and institutions in the country. That committee must be the committee who investigates judges make, and make recommendations to the Chief Justice. And the Chief Justice may either accept or deny. But what that creates, honorable members, it creates transparency. Transparency is one of the greatest factors that will make the common man feel he has a stake in the um, thing. And furthermore, that committee, Trinidad is a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. And therefore, judges should be appointed from all those different areas. By so doing, every man will feel of a stake in the judiciary. But finally, on that point, <clears throat> I humbly submit that in any organization, there, there might be friction. And that a mechanism must be put in place 
for judges who feel that they, they have problems, instead of giving a judgment and making a statement and going public in a particular way, that we sit quietly with that committee and solve the problems. By so doing, I humbly su submit, every man will feel they have a stake in society. That haven't been done, then we look to deal with the council. And furthermore, um, last point is, the Privy Council could be polluted in many ways. We say that they have their own budget and the way they appoint them and thing. But there are different ways of undermining the, the court. One, that persons who should know better attacks the, attacks the decision in public. That is like a banana republic. And we, we must be careful that we observe respect for the decisions of judges. If you don't like it, appeal. So, my brothers and sisters, that was the major points on the judiciary. I want to look at one point, and I'll be very short. Section 49. Section 49 of the Constitution, humbly submits that deals with the tenure of members of parliament. <clears throat> and Section 49A, 1, speaks about throwing a, parli throwing a parliament out of, out of um, office, a parliamentarian. Section 49 says, a, for section 49, it says that if a party expel you from, from um, you are expelled from the party after a few things, all the leader of the party has to do inform the speaker that you you are expelled and with a few things, and the speaker declares your seat vacant. That is the height of the undermining of a democracy. When you vote and I vote for somebody. We expect them to sit five years and serve us. But when in a party, all you have all kankarang and confusion and you have cliqueism in the party and they start a fight, next thing you are a victim and you get thrown out. What happens to the representation, to the representation of the people who voted? What happens? I humbly submit a section 49 a, should be abolished and removed from the Constitution. When you vote a man, let him stay there until, or let, you, let us have, let we who vote for him have the power we call. If he, he's not servicing, a 60% of the electorate will come together and we say, you're not serving us, we want you to go. But not resulting from a confusion and vindictiveness in a party and the leader just pelt you out like this. I humbly submit that having said that, that is the only section in the Constitution which mentions the word party. Every section in the Constitution speaks of the person who commands the majority of the vote, the Prime, Prime Minister, and the person who commands the next thing becomes the leader of the nation. Nothing about party. But this section, that speaks about party. Having said that now, why we must let that wild horse, that party, disturb and undermine our democracy? Never. We shouldn't allow that. What we should, now that we're in the Constitution, I humbly submit that we make recommendations in, in, the, in the Constitution to deal with the party, its organization, functions, and matters like that. Make them abide by some law, unlike in company law, senior. We must have the protection of the minority rights. But we need legislation to deal with the party. And unless that is done, we'll have all kind of mayhem, all kind of instability, and the undermining of the democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I will now ask Mr. Winston Rudder to come to the mic. May I do it from here? <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Moderator. As my friend Mr. Ragu 
already introduced me, uh, a proud Princestonian, and everybody here on this top table already knows that. <coughs> uh, this is our seventh uh, meeting, town hall meeting in this exercise of the National Advisory Committee for Constitution Reform. And what is beautiful for me, and I'm sure for my colleagues, is that everywhere we have been so far, there are gems of and pearls of wisdom that we would have lost if we did not go to that particular place. And so was it with Princess Town tonight. So, on behalf of the committee, of which I'm a proud member, we wish to express our gratitude for your being here, the patience you exercise, and the respect with which you treated with each other in the exchange during this con conversation. And we want to assure you that everything said, quite apart from the notes that would have been taken by each of us around the table, has been recorded and will, duly, will be duly transcribed and would form part of that working document that our chairman has indicated would go to the convention that eventually follows our exercise. So that the numbers here may, be, may have been small, but one of the books that some of us look at say, wherever one or two gathered in my name, I am well pleased. And indeed, we are well pleased to have been here this evening, to have listened to your rich contribution, and to assure you, your words were listened to, we heard you, we noted, and they will find a place in what we have to report in our working document. So on behalf of our chairman, members of the committee, I would wish to extend hearty thanks to you and wish you safe speed as you journey back to your residences. Thank you very much.